those of you who are online as well, I want to say welcome. God bless you all. We thank God for how he's been helping us through this year. We're in month four already, and the year has gone, is going so fast, so quick, before our very eyes. And I want to thank God for every one of you. And um, if you're online and you know about our social media feeds, that's fine. But if you don't, or even here in the hall, I want you to know that we are on LiveGate Outreach TV in, on YouTube. And all our messages are recorded there. And you can find us on podcasts of various kinds on your various devices, whether they be Apple or Android. Just go to podcast and look for LiveGate Outreach Center and you will find us there. I am confident that God is raising an army for himself in this end time. Praise the Lord. That is the inspiration of what we have got to do in our series that will last for the next 13 weeks. Praise the Lord. I think it is one of the longest. We've done 12 a few times, but 13 is probably the highest we've ever done. And we'll keep going. If God said we should do 20, we'll do 20. Maybe one year he will tell us to do 52. Who knows? <laughs> Hallelujah. We just do what he says we should do, and we get blessed. I want to share something that's been laid on my heart since very early last year to share. It's just I haven't found the time that God will want it shared until this particular time. We are in the end times, and the series that we are about to start is called Grace for the End Time Holiness. This is not a popular type of title in our modern day. I can assure you this. It is not attractive. It is not something that draws crowd. Holiness itself turns people away because people don't like to talk about it. And then you are talking about end time, talking about the return of the Lord, preparing the church for the return of the Lord. But what I want us all to understand is that as Christians, this is what we live for. This is what we live for. It's like a woman and children whose uh, husband or father has traveled all they expect is for him to return one day and that's the same way we are expecting the return of christ because he promised god promised us that he will send his son he has sent him he promised us that he would die for us he has died he promised us that he will rise again he has risen again and jesus when he rose again said i am going and the angel said this manner in which you see him go he shall likewise return so he is returning so when we talk about the end times, we are talking about the time as it gets closer and closer to his return. Whether it takes another day or another year or another thousand years, it doesn't matter. The truth is he will return because he cannot break his word. So we need to be living every day as if we are waiting. The Bible talks about those five virgins who were wise and were preparing every day for the coming of the bridegroom. And those who were not wise did not trim their lamps. They just lived casually. And when the bridegroom came, they did not have light in their lamps because there was no more oil. But the ones who were clever and were meticulously waiting had the opportunity of going with light to meet the bridegroom in Matthew 25. This is what every one of us should understand that should be our life. Thank God for everything we are accomplishing. But you just need to think a little bit about your life. I was at a friend's 60th birthday pastor friend 60th birthday yesterday and somebody whispered to my side at my side he said it was just like yesterday when we celebrated his 50th and that's true that's how quickly time flies i remember when i was 15 and my late father turned 50 in the year 1984 and i looked at my life at that time and i said to him i said dad you are now an elder <laughs> praise God because I was only 15 and I looked at a 50 year old man I felt this man is now very old <laughs> he just smiled that day God bless him and God rest his gentle soul he just smiled at me he didn't say anything in 2019 I went to see him just before he left us a couple of years later I went to see him in Nigeria and as soon as I walked at that year this is the year I turned 50 and as soon as I walked into the house he saw me he said David he said, you are now an elder. <laughs> I said, dad, you didn't forget. <laughs> and we both smiled. That time he was in his 80s already, of course. But that's how quickly it comes. Where did 35 years at that point in time go so quickly? So this time is flying by. And whether you like it or I like it or not, one day we will just find that he appears. Whether we're in the grave or we're still alive, it really doesn't matter. But the truth is we must understand that he is coming back. And so we're taking this time in this series to look at 
all that God has said already through his word about preparing for his coming. Especially to be careful about the things that will be happening. The prophecies that have already been said about the mannerism of men and the attitude of men. This is what this series is all about. And Paul was very succinct in his understanding of this kind of things that will be happening to mankind. I always say it is foolishness to see what God has said people will do and then go ahead to do it all the same. It is foolishness. <laughs> if God said somebody, people will behave in a certain way, it is mere foolishness for you to read it and then be behaving the same way. And if he has said that anyone who behaves in that way is not going to have a portion with him, why go ahead and do the same? So we are talking about multiplied grace this year and one of the graces that God wants us to have is the grace to have the kind of holiness, the kind of walk with God. Don't forget I told you holiness is our walk with God. Righteousness is our status in God. Holiness is our walk with God. So when we're talking about holiness, don't let your mind go to certain things that have been taught in religious schools. It is just about how you walk with God, how you are a friend with God, how you do the things that God, your friend, wants you to do. That's holiness. How you don't do those things that, your, that God, your friend, does not want you to do. The Bible says God looked at Abraham. He said, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. That is the way we walk together. That is the way we can walk together. I want to lead you to the promised land. I want to give you the promises I have promised, I've made to you. But there is a condition. You have to walk with me and you have to be perfect in your walk with me. So we are talking about this grace to be able to walk with God as he desires. This is why Paul, in, ra in raising Timothy in ministry, spoke to him. In his letter, what we read as the epistles of Paul to in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, he spoke to Timothy quite a lot about what the church should be. And the whole of 1 Timothy is much more about the characteristic of a leader in the church, understanding what it means to, to serve in leadership and what ministry entails and so on. But you see, when it now got to the second uh, epistle, that is 2 Timothy, he starts to talk a little bit more about preparing Timothy for the kind of things that a minister must make sure that they don't get involved in. And when we're talking minister here, he's not just talking about pastors, we're talking about Christians. And this is what led us, led him to this particular point in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where he now begins to tell him about being careful of what was going to happen in the end time. He called it perilous times. And so we start our sharing from there in 2 Timothy. I would like to read verse 1 to verse 5. I know we read up to verse 4 in our Bible reading, but if you can give me verse 1 to verse 5, every one of us will read it together as usual. So the title of today's session is Overcoming Self-Centeredness and Greed. Overcoming Self-Centeredness and Greed. Even though our series is going to be on grace for end time holiness, we are focusing today on overcoming self-centeredness or selfishness and greed. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 together. Everybody, let's go. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Verse 2, very important. That is our full part, where our part of where our focus is today. Verse 2, go. For men will be lovers of themselves... Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 2, verse 3. Unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Verse 4. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now verse 5, let's read verse 5 and shout it very loud and clear. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. Make sure that you are not partaking. That's what he's saying. With people who will look like it, but they are denying its power. Not because they are not doing miracles, signs, and wonders, but they are denying the power of the integrity of God's word. They are having a form of godliness, but they are brutal, they are proud, they are arrogant, they are unthankful, they are unholy. They are all those things I have just said to you. Even though when you look at them, they will seem to have a form of godliness. Go back to verse 2. 
The important thing I want us to understand here is that this is not talking about unbelievers. Because most people will be believers that carry a form of godliness, that have the Christianese. Praise God, hallelujah, I just love God, hallelujah, glory, glory. <laughs> Before you say something, they just wrap it. <laughs> a form of godliness. But in their lives, they are lovers of themselves. In their lives, they are lovers of money. They are boasters, they are proud, they are blasphemers, and so on. Our emphasis today is on the first two. And that is why I say we have 13 weeks to go through this. Because we are going to take everything week by week. Some of it two at a time like today. Some just one as God led, leads us. The first two is lovers of themselves and lovers of money. This is where we have got the concept or the topic rather of self-centeredness and greed. Overcoming self-centeredness and greed. Lovers of self and lovers of money. So when we talk about self-centeredness, thank you for the scripture. We're talking about another phrase for it is selfishness or self-conceit. Empty conceit. Self-centeredness can also mean selfishness or can also interchangeably be used with selfishness or empty conceit. This is when somebody is building oneself or projecting oneself at the expense of the others always looking down on others, directly or indirectly. And we need to understand that everybody is born with a degree of selfishness. You have to know about yourself. You have to love yourself. You have to be able to protect yourself. That is called self-preservation. Otherwise, we cannot exist in life. You have to know how to take care of yourself. That's very important. In fact, Jesus said you should love your neighbor as what? Yourself. That means you must love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, you cannot love your neighbor. You cannot give what you don't have. So there is a degree of self that we have to take care of. And let's all agree to that. There is no problem about that. This is not about saying that don't care about yourself or don't have any regard for yourself and so on and so forth. No. There is a level to which you have to take care of yourself. But you see, when taking care of yourself now begins to take over and your focus and mindset is always about me, myself, and I, and others are involved, and there is, no, uh, uh, there is no regard for looking into the case of others, especially where there is a need to do so, then it becomes self-centeredness. This is part of what we know is part of the works of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, the Bible tells us that there are many of these kind of works of the flesh, just like in, we have in the fruit of the Spirit, which are, we, we have just finished. So it talks about this self-centeredness. This kind of leads to disorder. Give me James chapter 3, and verse 16. This leads to disorder. Okay, thank you. That's Galatians 5.20. Yeah, bring it up again. Thank you. I didn't know you had it up. That's idolatry, what? Sorcery, hatred, contentious, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Every one of those words, you can take them and put them again in 2 Timothy 3, which we have just read. Selfish ambitions. Projecting self at the expense of others, regardless. It also, it's also tied to brutality. Just not caring about other people. James 3 verse 16 makes us to understand that this kind of tendency leads to every kind of evil. It leads to disorder. Thank you. Let's read it together. James 3 16, let's go. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Where there is envy, self-seeking, mannerisms he said all you are looking for in that place is you will be finding confusion and every evil thing whether that is in a marriage or in a family or in a nation envy self-seeking will only lead to confusion we don't need to be praying against confusion we don't need to be praying many times against evil because the things we are praying against and we are doing the things that feed them is a waste of time if you pray against confusion and you are living in self-seeking or self-centeredness and envy with your own spouse, you can only find confusion thriving the more. You have to stop being envious of your friend, of your spouse. You have to stop. Do you know that some couples are envious of each other? Have you ever heard such a thing? It happens. 
A man doesn't want his wife to progress. The wife says, okay, me too, I will make sure you don't progress. <laughs> and they walk. They are a husband and wife, I'm telling you. Amazing things. It is a spirit of the end time. It is part of what we have been warned will happen in the end time. It is a letting go of the evil force that will walk in the spirits and hearts of men in these times. You have to guard your heart against it. When you are self-seeking in a marriage, you will always find confusion and every evil thing there. When all that has to do in that marriage is about you, your convenience, you wear out the other person, and then all you find is that evil continues to take over. That person feels overwhelmed. They say, this person is placing too much of a demand on me. And then you find that they are winning in that marriage, and that is how evil persists in such places. When it persists in a church, even though they are a group of believers, they wear out the other brethren. They wear out the leadership of the church. Some people in this day and age, church for them is me, myself, and I. Nobody asked after me. Nobody gave me anything. Nobody smiled to me. Me, me, me. I, I, I. Every day is me, and it has to be about me. They preached about me. They didn't preach about me. They know what I'm going through. They don't know what I'm going through. It's just I, I, myself, me, myself, and I. If everybody lived like that, it would be full of contentious evils of all kinds. Church must be a place, and like any relationship, must be a place where we are not self-centered. Selfishness made the children of Israel to put God to the test. In, in Psalm 78, we read that verse 17 to 19. God took these people out of bondage in the land of Egypt. And the Bible says God was feeding them with manna. And was feeding them in the wilderness that they did not have a clue of how he was feeding them. But the Bible says from verse 17, we we'll read it to verse 19. It says, they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High, even in that wilderness. Because they were just thinking about themselves. Verse 18. Go to verse, we're going to verse 19, thank you. Verse 18 says, and they tested God in their heart by doing what? Asking for the food of their of their fancy. God was giving them manna, giving them water out of the rock. Manna from heaven, water out of the rock. They were asking for cucumbers. They were asking for lettuce. They were asking for cabbage. Things that they ate in slavery in Egypt. They wanted that food again. A people that had been de de delivered from the same place of bondage were asking for the food of the prison again because of their selfishness and self-centeredness. Verse 19, go to verse 19 very quickly. It says, yes, they did what? Spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Selfishness will make you doubt the integrity of God. It will make you undermine everyone else around you, including God. Just because it's about you and it's about your feeling. When some people feel sad, everybody around them has to feel sad. In fact, if you smile by mistake around them, you become their enemy just because they are feeling sad at that point in time. <laughs> and if they are happy, who born you not to be happy at that time? <laughs> you have to be happy by force. That is a self-centered, selfish person. Selfishness caused that rich young ruler. We don't need to read his, read his story. Matthew 19 tells us his story or Luke chapter 10. The rich wrong, young ruler said, he came to Jesus. He said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Jesus said, you know the commandments. You go keep them. He said, oh, I've done this since I was a child. <laughs> Jesus said, you know what? <laughs> I love you. But Jesus, the Bible said Jesus looked at him and, and loved him. And then he said, now you know what to do. One more thing you need to do. Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. Then come and follow me. And the Bible says that man went away sorrowful. The only man recorded in scripture came to Jesus Christ, asked the questions, got the answers, and still went away sorrowful. What a pathetic case. <laughs> Praise God. He went away sorrowful. Why? Not because Jesus told him something that is not true. Not because Jesus did not love him. Because the Bible said Jesus looked at him and loved him. Not because of anything, but simply because he could not see himself letting go of those things that he amounts to himself. The Bible says he went away sorrowful for he had many possessions. He was putting his life and tying his life and the things that he has to those possessions. And he could not let go. It was just a test. It was just a test. 
Every one of us must not allow ourselves to ruin our friendships because of selfishness. James 4.3 tells us that even it hinders our prayers. Self-centeredness hinders prayers. When you are praying and your heart is always about you, look at what the Bible says in James 4.3. Thank you. Let's read it together. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasure. And you know you cannot fool God. You can say, Lord, if you give me this thing, you know I will serve you all my life. He knows your heart. <laughs> so he will not give it because he knows that what you are saying does not correspond with what is really in your heart. This is why many times it looks as if God is not answering prayers. It's not because he's mean. In fact, it's because he's loving. There are some things that if God gives to some people, they will no more be Christians. I'm telling you. They are Christians today simply because they are still looking for that thing. And God knows. He knows that the day they get it, that's the last day you will see them. He will just say bye to all everybody. <laughs> and he's not wicked. He loves them so much. So he continues to make sure that that thing doesn't get to their hand. Go pull up that verse again. Pull up that. He said you ask and you do not receive. Because... Not because God is mean. Not because God did not hear. Not because God does not know what to do. Or because God cannot answer. He said, because you are asking amiss. And then he explained the meaning of asking amiss. He said, that you may spend it on your pleasure. So it's not enough to say, oh Lord, you know, like Hannah said, that I will give you this child if you give him to me. It's not enough to say it. God is looking at the heart. That job that you are saying, Lord, if I can just get this promotion... My tithe will increase. He knows it, the one you are doing now, the tithe has not even matched up to what you should be doing. So he knows exactly. He will just be laughing. The Bible says God will sit down in heaven and laugh. He laughs many times because he knows exactly what the heart of man is. The selfishness in our heart in many cases is what is hindering us from being the persons that God wants us to be. But what this series has come to do, and this topic particularly, is to break every stronghold of self-centeredness in you. I say to break every stronghold of self-centeredness in every one of us. In the name of Jesus. Luke chapter 12, where we go to verse 16 to verse 20. We have read it before. Dr. Matthias led us earlier on, for those of you that may not know, in the Bible reading today, we have three portions, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4, Luke 12, 13 to 21, and 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10. Luke 12, 16, Luke 12, 16 to 21. Jesus spoke a parable to them. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, verse 18, I, if you have time, count the I that is there. When I counted about six, I, I say enough. I'm not counting again. But there could be more. He said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. Everything is just him, him, him. No thought, no thought. How much, how much do you want to store for yourself? How much do you want to store for yourself? How many rooms in a house can you sleep at once? How many cars can you drive at once? That's what this man is saying. I will store all my crops and all my goods. He said in verse 19, he said, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. I have planned up to my retirement. He said, take your ease, eat and drink and be merry. No consideration of giving to others that may not have had the same privilege of life. The Bible says the grounds of a certain rich man brought forth plenty. That simply means some other people's grounds were not doing as, pet, as, as good. And those are the kind of people that God expects that this kind of person should look out for and help their own grounds or help their own produce in such a way that what he has got to an overflow can reach those people. Instead, he said, I will build my own barn and say to my own soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. <laughs> but what did God say? Let's read verse 20 together. Let it, let's see what God said to him. He said what? But God said to him, 
fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Whose will those things be? Now don't get me wrong. In this life, you should work hard to leave a good legacy. A good legacy of a name, good legacy of property and things that the next generation coming after you, especially those that you brought into the world, should have something that they can leverage and build upon and live for the generations to come. It's the way God designed and patterned life. Abraham left things to Isaac. Isaac left things to Jacob, Jacob, and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is that it should not be such that you are planning for those, that, that, that type of legacy in such a way that you have a total disregard for the things that also matter as you are building that legacy. God called him a fool. Psalm 14 one says a fool is the one that says in his heart that there is no God. A person not thinking the way God wants them to think is a fool. It's not somebody who is talking in a language that, that sounds foolish. Or somebody that is grammatically incorrect. That doesn't make a fool. A fool is somebody who has a disregard for the principles of God. Has a disregard for loving God with all his heart, all his might, and all his soul. Having a disregard for loving their neighbor as themselves. That's a fool. They say there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. When people are foolish, they can never do good. God called this man a fool. Go back to verse 21 of Luke 12. Thank you. He said that kind of person is exactly like this. Let's read verse 21 together. He says, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. May God deliver us from selfishness. Friends, it's the spirit of the end time. You have to fight it. You have to fight it. Everything we are going to be talking about this whole time, we are talking about grace to fight them. You can't fight them off in your own strength. They are very subtle in many cases. Self-centeredness is such a very subtle spirit. Many times you will, you will talk in terms of self-preservation, like I said, or wanting to leave a legacy or doing the things that seemingly are right. Saving money is not bad. You should save. You should have savings. It's, it's responsible living to have savings. So having those things, having a house, having houses, having cars, is not bad. But when those things have to be done in such a way that you are living a life of an overflow that is only to yourself and is not flowing out to others, then it becomes selfish. It becomes self-centeredness. We need to combat this sinful habit with genuine humility. Humility, recognizing that God gave us everything. There is nothing we have in this life that has not come from Him. Every one of us was born a baby that came into this world naked. Or have you ever seen a child come out of the womb? And when he came out, he had gold trinkets and uh, he had a gold wristwatch, Rolex, in his, on his <laughs> hand. And he came out and said, yeah, I'm here, man. If you see such, won't you, won't you run away? You run. You take, you flee. Even the nurses and the midwives there, nobody will stay there. <laughs> they say an abomination has been born. Nobody came, comes with those things. We all came into this earth naked and whatever they put on us after we are gone, it's just a waste of time. We are going naked anyways. You must die to self to the point whereby you allow God to walk in and through your life. Everything God gives you is because there's somebody that can benefit from it. I say it again. Everything God has given to you is because there is something somebody can benefit of that thing. Whether it's a good name or whether it's a position, whether it's a possession, whatever it is, you check it. As soon as you are receiving it, keep asking, Lord, who am I to bless? Thank you for this. I will enjoy it. But who am I to bless with it? Who am I to bless with it? If you want to be getting from God very easily, live like this, you will just be having inflow into your life. Inflow into your life, whether it is money or anything. But many people do not understand that like that man who was pulling down his barns to build greater, we fail to allow God to see our wisdom in him because we are also being insular and refusing to embrace the things that we ought to do. Being humble means you see yourself as God sees you. No more, no less. 
Humility is not just about seeing yourself more than God expects you. Romans 12.3. When we read Romans 12, 3, we look at it the more highly as in a higher level. At times, even seeing yourself less is also more highly in the context of that scripture. Let's read it together. He said what? For I say to you, let's read it together, please. For I say to you, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think what? Soberly. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. What he's saying here is that think when he says soberly there, it doesn't mean again degrade yourself. But he's talking about seeing yourself as God expects you to see yourself. As God has given to you a measure of faith and he has given everyone a measure of faith, everybody should think. Don't think yourself more highly. When you think yourself more highly, you are arrogant. When you think yourself less of who God says you are, even though it may look as if you are introvert, it may look as if you are just gentle, but the truth of the matter is that you are undermining who God says you are, and that itself is sinful. You must understand who God says you are and live exactly the way God wants you to live. Don't live in arrogance and don't live in self-pity. Both undermine the integrity of God as to who God says you are. You are a child of God. You are the son of the Most High. You are a priest. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar person. Embrace your status in Christ with humility and let God walk in and through your life rather than seeing yourself any less. When you withhold the good that God has given to you in the name of humility, that is not humility. That is stupidity and foolishness. God gives you a gift to be able to be a blessing to people. You say, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I just like to be quiet. I don't like to do anything. I don't, I just don't. No, what you are saying is that even though this is the gift God gave me, I'm burying it because I don't want people to say anything about me. That is pride. That is pride. If you are proud, you can't preach the gospel. That's the truth. You can't. It's not your humility that is preventing you from preaching the gospel. It's your pride because of what people will say. Especially those of us who are always talking every week like this. Because you are worried that people will see you and say, Ah, this man is always talking about this, talking about that. You have to learn how to shun those kind of things before you can preach. You cannot preach even to somebody one-on-one -on -one if you are proud. So it's not humility not to be it's not humility to be timid. It's not humility to be fearful. No. That is pride. Because we always look at pride as arrogance. So I don't want to waste too much time on that. Everybody understands. When somebody comes with an air of arrogance, you can almost cut it with a knife. It's so strong. You feel it. In fact, their demeanor can be very annoying. <laughs> you can see that. So everybody knows that. So I'm not talking about that kind of pride. I'm talking about this one that most times we don't know is pride, but it's just pride. Is self-centeredness. You're refusing to do what you should do simply because you're afraid of what people will say is self-centeredness. God says you should do something, then you are refusing to do it. And because, why? Because of what people will say. They say, oh, because of what people will say. I want you to know that as long as you live like that, it is the spirit of the end time, self-centeredness. Break out of it. Be who God says you should be. Don't look at your life alone. There is nothing I'm doing today that if it is just for me to look at my life alone and what, I will not be doing any of those things. I could be very, very contented with many things that I'm doing today that I don't need, that I would not need to do just to live life and, and, and go on. I'm telling you, I'm not, this is not by God's grace a, a boast. I don't need it. I don't need it in terms of what God has done for me. I've been working since age 20. I'm 55 years old now. I've been driving for almost 40 years. To give you context of how, how long I've been around here. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so I've done things. I've been everywhere. I've been to many countries. Many countries. My wife and I have been to many countries. At times we even forget. And I remind her, do you know that, that time we went to? She said, yeah, that's true. At times we confuse two countries. <laughs> because we experience things that look like the same. We've been things. We've been, done, we've been doing things. And I'm grateful. But you know something for me to... Fulfill mandate and to be here every week doing what I'm doing now is because there is something that somebody else must get. 
there is something that something must be passed on to somebody else for their own life to make progress as God helps me to make progress as well. This is why we do what we do. You must be humble. Look to your neighbor to the left and the right. Say, please be humble. I said left and right. You did one side. I was waiting. I'm a teacher. I would know. <laughs> Don't forget that I'm a teacher as well. I'm a lecturer as well. So I said left and right. You say, please be humble. I'm waiting for the second one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Please be humble. There's a funny story of a man who was given a, a prize for being the most humble man on earth. And as soon as they were about to give him the prize, when he stretched out his hand to receive it, they took it away. They said, the fact that you want to collect this prize, you have failed. <laughs> that you want to collect a prize that calls you the most humble man on the earth. You too, you stretch your hand and say, thank you for it. <laughs> because that your action makes you proud. Even though they said they recognize you as the most humble man on the earth, the most humble man truly will say, oh, thank you very much, but you know what? I can't take this. <laughs> now you understand. <laughs> but they say you are the most humble man on the earth. Come and collect it. He said, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> they, they took it away. They say, ah, definitely it's not. We are still looking for the most humble man on the earth. <laughs> Be humble. Humility will take you far. It will take you to places that you cannot imagine. But when you are full of yourself and all you think about is yourself, your convenience. My wife said to me in the course of the week, he said, Tammy, you need to rest. He said, you've been working very hard. He said, you need to rest. At times, I just carry on. Yesterday, I was in about four meetings for people, doing things for people, just to help people, people, people. My Saturdays should be days I, sh I should shut down because of the way my week goes very busy. But I still went ahead and did those things. She looked at me. She said, you need to find some time to rest. And I want you all to understand that we don't do those things because we just want to make a name for ourselves. We do it because we have to be selfless. We have to be selfless. I saw my father lived a selfless life. And my grandfather first lived a selfless life all his years, and rested well. I saw my father do the same. Why should I do any less? I learned from those men that when you just empty yourself every time, you, be, you are a friend of God. He protects you. He guides you. He takes you to places that you could never have reached. My father used scholarships from age 15. In their time, age 15, till he studied up to age 50, he was using scholarships and scholarships and because his parents both died. He used scholarships within Nigeria, used scholarships in America. God opened doors for such people. Some of the men, I humbly say to you, some of the men, my father was very selfless in raising today. Raising and raising, working with them, making sure that they were well discipled, becoming Christians. Some of them, their children, they are, we are together in this church today. I won't tell you who they are, so you won't be saying, ah, so, <laughs> no. <laughs> but their children are here today, including my own wife. At least I can tell you that one. Including my own wife. My father was just on scholarship, like I said, earning bits and bobs of money. He took, he saw my father-in-law way many years ago. He saw my father-in-law now in our town. He said, what are you doing now? My father-in-law told me this story the first day he saw me in the year 1992. And he said, you want to marry my daughter? I said, yes, sir. You sure you like her? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm very glad that God has done this for me. I said, sir, what do you mean? And he told me the story. He said, your father gave me money to go to school and to join the army so that I can join the army because he saw me at home not doing much. When he was just a student collecting scholarship money, he saw my father-in-law and he said, you don't need to be here. You can go to school. He gave him money to school and then that's how he joined the army and the rest is history. He told me that story himself, my father-in-law. So he said, I have no dowry to collect from you. All I need to ask you to do, you want a wife free of charge? <laughs> All of you are already planning. <laughs> you want free of charge? <laughs> That's the secret. <laughs> he said, I have no dowry to collect from you. You just go through the customary rights, anything family wants, you do all those things. Say, but me to collect dowry from you? Say, nothing. 
Say, your father made the biggest impact in my life at the time it mattered the most. That's good enough. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So you never can tell. And there are a couple of other people here, I won't tell you, but I know the impact my dad played in their father's life. When God said, don't live to yourself, he knows what he's saying because it is a transgenerational blessing. There are places I go today that people still today, people will still tell me, your father did this. Your father, and I didn't know all that at that time. So your father did this. The day we were burying him, they said people should come and be giving testimonies. This one came out, they said, my father paid for my uh, uh, forms to, get, to go to master's college. I said, who is this one? I asked my sister. I said, do you know this person? She said, I don't know where that one is called. In our house, you will see about 15 people at a time. You say, who is this one? They say, it's your cousin. Who is that one? It's your cousin. Everybody, your cousin, your cousin. <laughs> one day I called my mom. I say, how many cousins do we have? Which, which kind of family is this one? Everybody. You had only three of us. So where, who are these cousins? Everybody's your cousin. <laughs> Praise God. But today, you know, the story is different. And this is why at times I don't rest. In my own little way, of course, a lot to do. But my only two way I learned from there that, you know something? You just reach out to other people every time. God will be on your case every time. This is why you cannot fight me and survive. If you fight me, you are fighting God. <laughs> it's not a boast. It's not an empty boast. You cannot fight the person who is truly a friend of God. You can't. You will be crushed. You will be crushed. In 2017, I called a group of leaders who were here in this church that time. I said, God has laid on my heart that we should buy this building. We were here about four years that time. I said, let's buy this building. I said, I don't know how much it will be, but we want to try and raise about a million pounds. I took them to a retreat, to a place that we should pray together. I didn't know that as we were praying, their heart was already fainting. <laughs> One million pounds? <laughs> if you know how we were at that time, you will not. Now, maybe it may look like, oh, it's, it's, it's okay. But that time, there is no, ah, how can you be talking one million pounds? <laughs> so as we came back from that retreat, one by one, they started to leave the church. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Now, I'm not slighting any one of them. I'm just telling you my experience. This is my experience. And this, God sees my heart. I love those men and women. A lot of them, we started together in the very rough days. Till today, I still thank God for them. And I will never forget their labor to help the work go get off the ground. But this was what happened. One by one. And I remember Jesus Christ as one by one people were leaving him and were leaving him and were leaving him. <laughs> God be praised. To talk the fact that we are now talking about buying the building is a mystery. To the point where God has helped us from that 2017 to where we are today is a mystery. So you be a person that is in the line with the will and purpose of God. Let prayer and love for scripture, apart from humility, let prayer and love for scripture also be your help. Psalm 119 verse 36 says, turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Psalm 119 verse 36. Let my heart always move away from selfish gain. Everything that will always want to point you to you yourselves, to you yourself. Yeah, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness, selfish gain. Incline my heart to your testimonies, your word, and not to covetousness or selfish gain or selfishness. Every one of us must have a love for scripture indeed. We must have a love for the things that God said we should do and a love for the things that God said we shouldn't do. It helps us to overcome selfishness and self-centeredness. The third cure for selfishness or self-centeredness is to know where your treasure is. Are you working for everything that is only on this earth? Are you laboring for what is on this earth? The Bible says it will perish. It will perish. Whatever you have today, just give it some time. Before your very eyes, it will grow old. I remember in the year 2003, I just bought a brand new Toyota Avensis. Let me even go back. In the year 1997, I was given a, a brand new Peugeot 406, red. There were only two of it in the town I lived, in northern Nigeria. They brought them from France for a project we were doing. And I was 27, 28. I was very young. Many times I'll tell my driver, go home. 
I just want to drive that car. <laughs> because I enjoyed it when I get into it. You know, when you are driving a car, there's only two of it in the whole town. You'll be the talk of the town. Myself and my boss, he had a blue one, I had a red one. So when I'm driving it, you know, I was very young. So young people, you know, the way you think is very different. <laughs> it's not like now. <laughs> like now, I don't think I'll do something like that. But that time, I, I was a Christian minister. <laughs> but the thing got into my head. I enjoyed it. As you are driving, people are looking at you everywhere. Wow, turning. Then you look at the rear mirror. The one who did not turn, you see, you didn't see my car. <laughs> as soon as you park, everybody, you know men, men and cars. As soon as I park, I come out of it. Some of the rich guys in town will come. Say, David, and some of them knew us because we were in a, a consulting firm that was very popular in that town. They come, David, how do you guys get this car? Because there was none of it yet in the country. They were imported fresh from France. It was a couple of years later they started to bring them. That car today, all of it, I don't know whether you can see any of it in town. They're all in the junkyard. <laughs> Just 25 years ago, they're all in the junkyard. A few years later, I got to this country. God started helping me. I, brought a, I bought a brand new Avensis, Toyota. And that was also looking sparkly then. I remember going to see a guy. Uh, I was trying to work something out for University of Wolverhampton with a company. And uh, the guy was very arrogant, very arrogant. He looked at me and said, yeah, what can you do? And blah, blah, blah. And I was just talking, trying to explain to him what I was about doing. And then... We finished the meeting. I don't know whether he believed me or not, but we finished the meeting. We started going out. When I got outside, I wanted to show him again. I was still young that time, 20 something years ago. 20 years ago, you have to forgive me. So I wanted to show him that he has been very arrogant to me. Now I will, I will oppress him. Because I know that the car, many people liked it that time. I flicked the thing from where we are standing. I could go to my car to put my key. But I wanted him to see my car do quick, quick like that. <laughs> One English boy like that. He was very arrogant to me. So we're still very far. I was moving the remote. It's not yet working. I pushed him a little bit more. I pushed him to where the remote will work. I pressed it. He said, quick, quick, quick. He said, hey, is that your car? I said, yeah. <laughs> now you get the point. <laughs> That is it. You are oppressing me inside now. I oppress you here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. You know? But I, I can't... In that car today, if you find any of it around, I'll be... <laughs> My point here is that everything you have in this life, it will go away. It will go away. It is very true. Everything in this life will perish. In my line of work, I do a lot of refurbishment work where we model buildings, whether domestic or big buildings. At times, I even testify of some of those projects on my social media feeds. We just finished one very recently, very lovely building in Enfield in London, and um, to the glory of God. And I go into some of these properties, and I see when they are wrecking them down to try and do something new. And I stand there, and I say, you know, some time ago, 70 years ago, 80 years ago, this was somebody's dream. This was somebody's architectural masterpiece. Here we are wrecking it down now to make something that is more contextualized and relevant. It will go one day. So don't put your mind on the things that are on this earth. Let your mind, let your treasure be in heaven, in the things that matter to God. We can read Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Don't turn to it. But Acts 20, 35 says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Understand this very well, and you will live in continuous contentment all the days of your life. Paul said, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is what? More blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. When your treasure is heavenly. You are happy to give of your time. You are happy to give space to people. We live in a very cultural society. Despite everything that people say about this country, thank you for the scripture, it's one of the most cultural places you had. Last week I was talking about how courtesy reigns on our roads compared to many other countries. It's very true. People open doors for you. In this country, they open door, hold it. In many 
times. People will open the door, hold it for you, as many of you that are passing, unless somebody else comes to collect it. It's courtesy. You're on a queue, and then you're, they, you are serving, and they, they, you know everybody's taking something, and uh, it's a buffet. And uh, you get there, and uh, there are only two pieces of the chicken left, and there are about two or three of you left on the queue. Don't just carry the two and say, well, God has buttered my bread. That is it. I'm gone. <laughs> Praise God. You ask those two people that are with you. And you, if you're really hungry, you pray that they don't say yes. <laughs> you ask them and say, do you, do you mind? And they say, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. Then you take one so that they can decide who takes the other two. <laughs> the other, among them, who takes the other one? Just little acts of courtesy. Little acts of courtesy goes a long way. Every child is born selfish and you have to curtail their selfishness very quickly. This is why when a child wants to cry here, it doesn't care whether we are 50 here or 100 or 200 or 1,000. It doesn't matter to him. He will just cry because as far as he's concerned or she's concerned, it's about me. I'm hungry. Wah! I said I'm hungry. Wah! Or I'm wet. Wah! We must understand that we have to let children know as they grow. Of course, we attend to babies, but as they are growing, you, like, you start to need to tell them that life is not all about you, young man. Life is not about you alone. When my children were very young, the eldest was just about five years, six years, and the youngest was barely two. They were very young, very young. I went to a bank one day to collect money. Those days, you have to go to the bank to physically collect cash if you are traveling especially to some countries that cards didn't work well at that time. This was about 20 years ago. And uh, I, I stood there. It took about 45 minutes for this lady to process the funds because those days they would take your photo, they would take your ID, they would, you would, as if you are in a prison district, they do from here, mugshot from here, mugshot, just to collect 2,000 pounds or so <laughs> in this country. And we were there processing all that. When we finished and the woman gave me the money, I was traveling on official, so the money I needed to collect, I collected it. When I was about going, she called me back. She said, sorry, sir, can I just ask a question? I said, what is it? She said, are those your children? She said, yes. She said, they are so well behaved. She said, for the past 45 minutes, I've been looking at them. None of them, even the youngest one, ran away or anything that you had to chase them to say, come back here or anything. For that period, they stood exactly where I stood as if they were doing the same transaction with me. He said, I'm impressed. I smiled. I smiled because I know what it takes to make that happen. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. I packed my children. I left there. But it doesn't just happen like that. There are times that they will climb. Okay, let's go. That's it. <laughs> you have to tell children how to behave. Oh, this one, somebody will tell me, a three-year-old, you say that is their, oh, that is his behavior. What behavior at age three? No, he can't be throwing tantrums at age three and say that is his behavior. If you don't curb it, when he's 30, he will throw it in the office and make life difficult. He will throw it to his wife when he's married. He will throw it to her, she will throw it to her husband when she's married because nobody told him or her that you don't throw tantrums because you are not happy. It's not about you alone. It is about us. And what works for us every time. Know where your treasure is. Very finally, finally, let's talk about greed very quickly. Greed is very close to selfishness, but it is a very strong desire. Selfish desire to have more of something. Selfishness is just thinking about yourself regardless of order. Greed is a kind of selfishness that just wants you to take more. More money, more power, more, more, more position. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with wanting more of things in life. But if it is just like that man who was the, regarded as a fool, then you need to understand that that is not the will of God. Let's go back to Luke 12, very quickly, verse 13. Jesus warned us, Paul warned us, and that's where we'll close today. Jesus said in verse 13, Luke 12, 13. He said, then one from the crowd said, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you. Verse 15. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Your life does not consist in the abundance of the things you possess. We are tempted in life to want to make a status statement. 
And so in the name of that, we acquire more, acquire more, acquire more. And God is saying that it is not in your place of acquiring more and more and more that life will be defined. Your life becomes covetous when you are only trying to gain your identity in the things that you possess. Your name, your titles, your houses, your cars, your clothes, your shoes, the things you wear. Those are the things you are trying to define yourself by. And God is saying that when you continue to try to, you will only be chasing the wind. Because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Paul came and warned Timothy as well in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 10. We read that earlier in our Bible reading also. It says, now godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Be godly, but be content with it. That will give you gain. Is great gain. Verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain, somebody say it is certain, we can carry nothing out. It's certain. Everybody must understand that in life, the older you get, you must start to think, what am I leaving behind? If you are going to leave wealth and property for, for children, but the name you are living because somebody did somebody lost out. You steal money, for example, in some countries where politicians would take money that they are supposed to use to build roads that lead people in the communities to hospitals and things. And they use that money to train their own children in foreign countries or in expensive country in expensive schools in the same countries. They are not living a good legacy. They are living for themselves things that will bring curses on them. Because every day people die on those roads. They curse those leaders. They curse those leaders. When you are living life as if you are going to carry something out of it, you are living a life that is a fallacy. Because it is certain that we are going to carry nothing out of this country. Kill greed. It is a very subtle spirit. It will just say, have more. When you have that thing, you say, take the next one. Have more. And as I say to you, as long as it is a desire for you to increase so that you can have more influence, that is fine. To be a blessing to others, that is fine. But if it is just about you trying to gain this status, the Bible says you should be careful. Verse 8 says, and having food and clothing with this shall be content. Verse 8. Having food and clothing with this, we shall be content. Verse 9. Let's read verse 9 together, everybody. Verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful loss, which drown men in destruction and perdition. He didn't say those who are rich. He didn't say those who God made rich. God is not against riches. He's not against your wealth. He said, I am the one, Deuteronomy 8.18, I am the one that gives you power to make wealth. He is not against it. But you see, I want us to understand, even in the so-called prosperity message of today, and this is where I may ruffle some feathers, we are preaching greed as opposed to the true biblical prosperity. We are teaching people to be desired. Let me not say we. Some other people, God forbid, I put myself inside. By the grace of God, I will never be among them. Teaching people to desire to be rich rather than teaching people to, be, to desire to be lovers of God who makes rich. And so you see people come out and do testimonies and say, praise God, this time last year, I just used to squat. But now I built three mansions. Nobody asks a question. Whether he falsified books, now I'm saying, now I know God can do wonders. I'm not undermining that, but many times it is a promotion of greed that has forced people to go and find ways to cut corners. And we turn them to testimonies. And there are brothers genuinely sat in the same congregation wondering, are we serving the same God? <laughs> we teach people to desire to be God lovers rather than desiring to be rich. Because those who desire to be rich will fall into temptations and a snare. None of us will fall into a temptation and a snare. In the name of Jesus. The prosperity message that is of God has nothing to do with greed. Whether greed on the part of the clergy 
or greed on part of the laity. It has nothing to do with greed. Some pastors in the name of having wardrobe have been taking wardrobe allowances from their church. And then it's not just about buying basic clothes. They buy expensive clothes because they are competing with other pastors. These are the things that we don't talk about where we must. Because may God help us not to become part of the same. I say may God help us not to become part of the same. There are people who will give pastors money. The pastor will not ask this brother, ah, what do you do? Every day you just come and 500 pounds, 500 pounds. What do you do? I need to know what you do. <laughs> Praise God. But the man is just enjoying the money. Whether he is a fraudster, tricking people all over the place, collecting money in dubious ways, he doesn't want to know. Greed. Greed. Everybody desiring to be rich, they fall into temptations and a snare. And they fall into many foolish and harmful loss. It is a spirit of the end time. Let's be very careful. Be content with what you have. Enjoy what you have. Go to verse 10. Enjoy what you have. Greed will not allow you to see your wife and enjoy her alone. Greed will not allow you to keep your eyes on your husband alone. Greed wants you to have more, more, more. A man has everything, but he will fight to have power. Because when you have money and everything, and you don't have power, it will seem as if you are lacking. The day you have the power, he will want you to have more. He will, you have power over your nation. Have you seen nations that are trying to annex other nations? Greed, greed, greed. Hmm. Let's read verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Let's stop there. The love of money. Money that should serve you becomes something that is your God in pursuit of money. Money, 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 money. When you say good morning, the next thing somebody says is money, good morning, money. They don't even know how to put good morning without saying money. <laughs> money, money, everything money. Friends, money is meant to serve you. Don't serve it. He said, for which some have strayed. Sorry, put it back up now. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. They have strayed from the faith in their greediness. They used to be Christians in the so-called mentality of wanting to gain prosperity or to prosper. They stray from their faith because they have gone on the side of greediness. We will be talking more about these things in the course of the week. Let us all be very careful. It means people pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Everything that God has given to you is good enough. There is more he has for you. Just wait upon the Lord and enjoy it. Hallelujah. God has given me a grace to know how to wait for things. I can wait for many years for things. I can wait. I can wait. God is helping me. I'm still growing in that area. But I found that I really don't struggle to wait for things. I can wait. I can wait for the position God wants to give me when it's time. I can wait. I can wait. Learn to wait. Because when you wait, you come into a place where you are never sorrowful. The Bible says in Proverbs 10, 22, For the blessings of the Lord, they make rich and they add no sorrow. When you rush ahead of time, you add sorrow to yourself. The principle is to remember... That God said he would never leave you nor forsake you. I conclude finally by saying that we must prayerfully overcome every form of selfishness and greed. Because God says it is generosity that attracts grace. If we want grace, we must be generous. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 to verse 9. It says, so let each one give as he proposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a what? A cheerful giver. Verse 8, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. This is our anchor scripture for the entire year, but let us remember. He said, and God is able to make all grace, verse 8, abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for what? For, for what? It's on the screen. Can you read it for me, the last phrase? May have an abundance for what? Every good work. It's not an abundance for show off. It's not a, an abundance for yourselves. It's an abundance for every good work. When you sow a good seed, it brings about the working out of every good work. Our heart desires should be seeking first the kingdom of God, being a blessing to others. We have the opportunity today of breaking bread. Jesus said, beware of covetousness. As we break the bread, 
we are going to be praying that God will help us every time we are going greedy, covetous. He will open our eyes. Because you don't know. Many times you don't know. What you do today helps others. I was saying to our fellows, we had a, a short social outing yesterday, and I was saying to them that every set before you have done something that has allowed us to bring in another set. And I explained to them how it works. That if you do, there's an event that we need to host others and host the main sponsors in the course of next month, I think. I said, if you do it very well, you sow a seed that will give us a good name and help us to bring in more people again next year to be a blessing like you. This program has transformed many lives. Many lives. Because it's not just those people that came here. Some of them have gone and have done fantastic stuff, trained other people. Oh, is that not true? Done stuff. Because a church, God helped us to get wisdom. And these men that run the program, they walk in the night. They selflessly do this thing. None of us get paid for anything. Maybe some of the aspects of the delivery, but nothing, nobody's on a salary to do it. But they do it in the night. They do it in the weekend, Sunday night. Prepare the programs, put it all together. We write the proposals through the night, through the weekends, through evenings many times. Just because it can bless some people that can be a blessing to their own communities. This is what this life is all about. And so I'm sure that this year, what God will be doing in your life and my life is that he will be taking us to places we never imagined. Just because we have decided to partner with him, to forget about ourselves as it were, and let him have his way in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise to our feet. Hallelujah.